and I'll take a closer look at looking at the processes involved in receiving trust money. So the first obvious step is that the money comes in. The money can come in by way of cash, uh, EFT, direct transfers, checks, all of those are valid ways that someone can pay money to the agency and from there our process begins. The next step is to issue a trust receipt to the client or customer that has paid the money to the agency. So we will look at this process now. Trust account receipts must contain certain information which is outlined in the Property and Stocks Agents Regulation 2014. So some of that information that's required is having the name of the licensee. So you can see that information is provided and the fact that it's a trust account receipt. So you can see that information. Next, you need to make sure that the receipts are consecutively numbered so you can't skip pages, you can't skip receipt numbers. It has to be the next consecutive receipt number from the previous transaction. And then you would put in the date that the money was received. Received from, you need to put in the information about who's actually paid the money. So if this was a tenant, you would put the tenant's name on behalf of who it was. So if that was a landlord that it was on behalf of that you took the money, then you would put their name in there. And also you need to have their identified ledger number. So that might be their client initials and house number that they live at. You also have to put the description of what it was for. So if that was going to be you know, an advertising payment um, and the property address. So you need to be able to determine what the purpose of the money was for. How you've received the money. So whether cash, F, post, check, money order, direct transfer, how was it received? How much was received for that transaction? who actually receipted it, so the name of the person issuing the receipt and their signature of the person. And they don't have to be anyone that holds a real estate agent qualification or an, be as an assistant agent. This can be anyone in the office issuing the receipt and they would sign off uh, having received that money. Once the money has been received and banked, we then need to record it in the trust receipts cash book or transactions from all properties in numerical order for the month of operation. Each receipt that you have completed needs to be entered into the receipts cash book in numerical order. So we'll have a look at this now. So the information that must be contained in a receipts cash book is the date that the money was received. So when did we actually get the money paid to us? And also the date that we issued the receipt. We need to put in the name of who paid it. So in our case, we've got W Lewis and we're using an identification code of Lewis 1L and that'll be up to the agency to create these identification codes which will be used throughout the cash books computer systems for that particular client to identify them. And then we're going to put in the description of the matter. So what was the payment for? So in this case we've got VPA advertising, so vendor paid advertising for an amount of $1,089. Receipt number we used was 10 and we banked it on the same day. So we would do that for every single transaction that we receive for that month. And then at the end of that month, we would calculate the total that we have received. The next step is to record in each individual trust ledger. The next step, after entering the receipt into the trust account receipts cash book, you then have to update the individual ledger that has been affected by the transaction.
So if we imagine that we're looking at the account of W. Lewis, ledger reference of Lewis 1L, and then we look at the sale of 8 Origin Street, Brisbane. So that is the account of this particular client. And we can see that the opening balance was zero. We started at nil. And then all of these transactions have transpired over the course of this month for this particular client. So on the 1st of the 9th, there was W. Lewis received, we received an amount um, on a receipt number 10 of $1,089. Then on the 4th of the 9th for ABC signs, we had to pay out via check number 10 an amount of $330 on that client's behalf. And then we have a progressive balance left of $759. Following that, we also paid on the same date, Photos Are Us, by check number 11, the amount of $220, leaving a balance of $539. And then on the 4th of the 9th, we also paid for realestate.com.au advertising with check number 12 for $539. And so then we had a balance of zero. Then after the marketing on the 20th of the 9th, we received a buyer deposit from D. Lockyer uh, for the amount of $25,000. So then the account is once again in credit to for $25,000. And on the 30th of the 9th, obviously settlement has occurred and we are going to transfer the balance of the deposit, which was paid out of the trust account via check number 18, amount of $1,487.50 leaving a balance of $23,512.50, which was then dispersed on the 30th as well as the commission for the agency, which was paid by way of transfer of that $23,512.50, leaving that client's ledger at a zero balance at the end of the month. Now that we have looked at the processes involved when we are receiving money into the trust account, we are going to look at what happens in the processes for dispersing or paying money out of the trust account. So when money is due to be paid out of the trust account, it is very important that this withdrawal from the trust account can only happen only after a transaction is completed. So even if you know settlement is going to be happening afternoon at 2 p.m., you cannot complete the withdrawal from the trust account until settlement has been effected and authorization has been provided. Speaking of authorization, it says with clients authorization, now authorizations can come via various forms. Authorization might be to pay for a repair or maintenance item, and these would be authority, so agency authority may have the authorization, or if there are amounts over and above, you would have to have a letter in writing from the clients. More information about this is contained in the learner guide for this module. It's the licensee or authorised person. So there can be someone else who is delegated the responsibility and generally they will have to um, have it written into their employment agreement and also have the appropriate qualifications and licence categories to be able to do this. The next step is to issue the trust cheque or transfer the money directly from the trust account to the client's nominated bank account. These are the only two authorised ways that you can pay money out of the trust account. You cannot issue cash out of the trust account. So all payments for customers, clients and suppliers are made by way of cheque or a bank transfer. Now that we're making payments out of the trust account, we also have to record these payments in the trust payments cash book. So each amount that's been paid out of the trust account is entered in order into the payments cash book for the month that it was paid out. 
So once again, if I just go through the details, you can see that the information we have is the date that the payment was made, followed by how much it was that we paid out for $330 with a check number 10. And we made the payment to AB Signs on behalf of W Lewis, which is the ledger that we've identified at the end. And the description for the amount that we paid out is a for sale sign board. So you can see that each of these is in order and how much and the check numbers so that we have a paper trail that's going to correspond with all of these amounts that have been paid out of the trust account. These payment transactions that are being dispersed from the trust account are going to be recorded in the trust ledger for each client. Let's now look at why we need to do a bank reconciliation. Why do a bank reconciliation? Managing properties is a pretty hard job, especially keeping track of all of that money. How do you know if all of that money is where it should be? You're not an accountant. A simple daily bank reconciliation is the answer. A bank reconciliation is making sure all of the receipts and payments in your agency's bank account are exactly the same as the receipts and payments in your property management software. In most regions, it is mandatory that a bank rec is conducted every month to make sure that all of your owner, tenant, creditor, and agent funds are correctly accounted for. But seriously, who can remember everything that happened a whole month ago? Reconciling Daily helps you to find any misplaced money and rectify those errors ASAP. Remember, you are dealing with other people's money, so if you have made a mistake with other people's money, then those other people will be really angry with you. A successful daily bank rec equals very happy clients and a happy you. In simple terms, a bank reconciliation ensures that the amounts showing in the trust bank account and the amounts in the trust account cash books are the same. In the legislation, bank reconciliations are covered under the Property and Stock Agents Regulation 2014, Clause 26, Records of Trust Account Transactions, which states under 6, the licensee must, at the end of each named month, prepare a statement reconciling the balance of the licensee's trust account with the balance of the related cash book or other record. The bank reconciliation needs to be performed after the month has ended, for example, the first day of the following month to ensure that all of the transactions have been completed and no late transactions come in after the reconciliation for that month has been completed. If there is a difference between amounts showing in the trust bank account and those showing in trust cash books and accounts cannot reconcile this is the result of a discrepancy and must be identified and remedied as soon as possible. The licensee must keep certain records and the records that must be kept by a licensee is covered under the Property and Stock Agents Act 2002 Part 7 Trust Accounts Division 1 Keeping and Inspection of Records Section 103 Licensee Records and Section 104 Licensee to Make and Keep Certain Records. When looking at this particular section you will see that the records that need to be kept include all source documents. So this includes your invoices, receipts, check butts, bank statements, a source document is anything that shows the original transaction. Your trust journals and cash books, so your payments cash books, your receipts cash books, your transfer journals. Trust checkbook, as well as the trust deposit book. Trust ledgers for each of your clients and their properties. Trial, trust trial balances and trust bank reconciliations. And all of these records need to be kept for at least three years after they are made, although many agencies will hold on to these under the ATO requirements, Australian Taxation Office, of five years.
Let's look at performing a bank reconciliation. The first thing we need to look at is what is our opening bank balance? So have a look at the bank statement to see what is the amount that we are actually opening the bank balance with and enter that in to your opening bank balance area. So in our example, we're going to use $10,000. The next thing that we need to look at is how much money have we received into the trust account for the month? We're going to assume that's another $10,000 that we're going to have received by way of rental payments, deposits for purchase of property, etc. Which gives us the subtotal of our opening bank balance plus our receipts journal total of $20,000. We then need to have a look at how much money have we actually paid out of the trust account? So we will enter in our check numbers and the corresponding amounts. So I'm going to just use basic numbering of one through to five for the checks. And I'm going to say check one was for $5,000. Check two was for $1,000. $1, check three was $500. Check four for $200. Five or one thousand dollars, which gives us a total of presented checks of seven thousand seven hundred dollars for this month. If there was an amount that we had put a check forward and it had not yet been presented, that's where we would have it another area of unpresented checks so that we can ensure that we've accounted for that. And finally, we're going to tally our total of our incomings and take away our outgoings to give us a figure of a closing balance, which is shown in our cash books as $12,300. So that is the figure that we should see on our trust account bank statement. So we would have a look at our trust account bank statement and compare the two uh, balance amounts to see are they identical. If they're not identical, we would need to go through each of the transactions to find out where it is that we've gone wrong or what the amounts are that are not marrying up to work out where the discrepancy lies and correct it.